This is University Lecture. Welcome to another in a series of lectures given on the campus of Iowa State University in Ames. Today we present Dr. Kennedy C. Fawcett of the Ames McFarland Clinic in a discussion of the use of technology in prolonging life. Dr. Fawcett. I'm going to uh, give you my life experience uh, in the growth of cardiology in my brief medical life history and let you share a little bit of the adventure and the excitement involved and then suddenly be faced starkly with the responsibilities that suddenly makes you realize you're carrying, not just to the patient or yourself, but to society. And then I'm going to ask you for help in the problem because I don't have the answers and I'll be fascinated as to your solutions for them. I graduated from medical school in 1956 and I interned at Temple University in Philadelphia and at this time I began to become more aware of my interest in the field of cardiology and heard of a very exciting experience that was hap that happened at Hahnemann which was down Broad Street a ways where a patient's heart suddenly went into fibrillation. Now that term is used to describe a worm-like movement, a non-effectual pumping but a worm-like movement of the heart which we are able to detect by way of an electrocardiogram. Most of you are aware of what that is. It's an electrical means of recording the dis electrical discharge or depolarization or loss of electricity from the heart. And we detect it on the surface of the chest, just as one would pick up brain waves by detecting, by putting electrodes on the brain. This patient was in, in ventricular fibrillation, and the intern stripped an electrical cord uh, off of a lamp, plugged it in, and I hope he had rubber gloves on, and put the, <coughs> the uh, wires on the patient's chest, shocked the patient, and miraculously the heart began to pump normally again. This by no means was the first time that uh, the heart had been successfully defibrillated, and most operating rooms at that time were prepared to place two cups on either side of the heart during periods of open chest surgery and shock the heart should this eventuality occur. And they were able to manage, for the most part, resuscitation of cardiac uh, of defibrillation procedures in the operating room, but nowhere else was this possible. It wasn't possible because by, by the time you could find the things to open the patient's chest with, three minutes were up and it was too late. And, and it seemed to be this was the only way you could proceed. I found myself in a residency, and I started out in a cardiology ward. It had 40 patients. I lost six patients that week, and I decided maybe I should go into pediatrics or something. I was, uh, I was depressed and frustrated at my inability <laughs> to predict sudden acute cardiac fatalities, and I found them dying all around me. And I wasn't talking about people 70 years old or 80 years old. I'm talking about people 40 years old. One was a young man, 29. I'm talking about a young man's disease, coronary arteriosclerosis. At that time, uh, we had some equipment called Electrodyne, and it was able to successfully defibrillate using alternating current, which is right out of the wall socket, with two paddles you put over the chest and you could shock the heart. And it had things you'd put on top of the chest to uh, give intermittent shocks, hopefully to cause the heart to beat. And you're supposed to set all this up automatically and leave the room hoping if the heart stopped, the thing would automatically go on and start everything. You'd come in, you'd find a patient convulsing, but you weren't sure if ever the heart was beating and most likely you had a dead patient. I then rotated to Philadelphia General Hospital and was fascinated by these little boxes that the doctors were carrying around with long knees, ne needles and they somehow had a penknife in their pocket and you just didn't dare die on the floor because somebody would rip open your chest and try to manually massage the heart and they'd stick these needles in the heart and turn on this little box that gave electrical impulses at a set rate 
and this was supposed to cause the heart to beat. We had a lot of drama and had been great on TV, <laughs> but I wasn't impressed and neither was anyone else. In 1960, uh, to my knowledge, uh, the first transvenous technique of threading a catheter, which is a flexible plastic-coated wire, in, the, in a vein. It could be a vein in the arm, it could be a vein in the neck. All venous blood goes to the heart. And by threading the catheter using x-ray to help you, you were able to place the catheter into the ventricular chamber. Now, I don't expect any of you to understand anatomy real well. Uh, I don't have any chalk, so I'll just describe. I think of the heart as uh, having uh, two chambers. In reality, it has four, but for simplicity, if you'll think of the upstairs, which is called the atrium, and the downstairs, which is called the ventricle. The initial approaches were to thread the catheter into the atrium on the right side of the heart and down into the ventricle, and there are muscle bundles called papillary muscles, and you would essentially then take the catheter and wedge it into, into the bundles so that it wouldn't be floating around. The initial catheters just had a single tip, and for electrical engineers, you all, all appreciated that that was one pole for the electrical current to flow, and the other pole was a needle or a wire or something embedded underneath the skin so the electricity would go through here, through the body, and out the the tip of the chest. That worked very successfully, but you would somehow get a little twitching occasionally uh, of the pectoral muscles or, or wherever you might happen to embed the other wire. So they came out with a bipolar catheter. It has the positive and negative poles, so the current just flows from here to here, and the patient is then able to be paced. Well, why is this necessary? Well, to try to unscramble this a little bit for you, I first talked about defibrillation. This is where you use 200 to, to 400 watts seconds. I just used another term, I'm sorry. Uh, I mentioned initially we used uh, alternating current. The next evolution, about 1961, I was in the Navy and they came out with direct current type of shocking and it was discovered that you had a better survival rate and uh, it worked much better. So that was an improvement for the defibrillation, the, the wormy heart. But hearts have other problems. Hearts stop. And when they stop, what do you do? I mean, you can shock it to your blue in the face, but you're not going to defibrillate it because it's not even moving. We have drugs that sometimes will help, but frequently the drugs didn't work. Or if they did work, then you ended up treating the toxic effects of the drugs. It's like a patient with a headache. You keep telling him to take aspirin, and then three days later you're treating him for aspirin poisoning, you know. And that's about the way. Uh, the drug management, freak, not frequently, but not infrequently, ended up. So, needless to say then, the techniques were devised so that we could then, in a heart that wasn't moving at all, get the electricity close to the heart without making every muscle in the body convulse and stimulate the heart periodically so that we would have a heartbeat. I came to this community in 1962, and about five years ago, every one of you and myself lost a dear friend. And I guess sometimes we need that uh, to uh, stimulate us to do something uh, worthwhile. I have always regretted his going in many ways, in more ways than you'll ever know. I feel this man was a young man in my view. He was not an old man. He was a father and he had a family. And he was one of the finest leaders this community has ever known. He died essentially of a heart that was beating in such a manner that life could not be sustained. And had there been something available to have corrected that abnormal rhythm that he had, in the face of the failure of drug management, which is what happened, ma drugs were not affecting the problem, he might be sitting here today listening to this lecture. He might not, but he might. 
Now, as far as this community is concerned, it had none of these things I've talked to you about. It's now 1965. Uh, I had had some experience uh, with it uh, for five, seven years prior to that, and this community did not have a piece of any, anything of that nature that would allow each of us to have these advantages. There were citizens in the community that were interested and, and rendered financial support to the efforts to procure a piece of equipment which allowed us to defibrillate, get rid of that wormy action, and allowed us to use a catheter to stimulate the heart when necessary. I might say, by the way, it's a very painless procedure to put this in. An incision is made in the neck with a procaine, the patient's awake, and you talk about poker or what's your hobbies, and, and under x-ray view, you put it in the heart, they don't feel that, and when it does stimulate the heart, they don't feel anything. Well, that was great. Now we had the hardware. And by golly, within a few days, we had some interesting things happen. One was a child brought in the emergency room and was uh, in ventricular fibrillation and was shocked successfully and went home. That was a save. It was a, you know, I really hadn't imagined we would be using it this much. I must confess, when I first came to the community, somebody mentioned that to me. I said, well, we're in a young community and, you know, we really don't need all that equipment. That's what I knew. Okay, next thing that happened was we had two patients with heart block. Now, well, that means their heart was beating, but very slowly, like 28 beats a minute, uh, 30 beats a minute, and occasionally it'd have a convulsion because it'd be a long strip of nothing. And, uh, aha, that's an indication for a temporary pacemaker. Now, by temporary, the catheter I'm passing around is, our is, the, is the pacemaker, is the catheter I use for a temporary procedures. And to clarify, many people who have an acute injury to the heart uh, require only a temporary period of pacing. More accurately, they need a temporary period of having a catheter in place to pace if you need to. Now, I don't want you to have the idea that if you have a coronary, that right away somebody's going to put a catheter down your jugular vein. No, sir. No, sir. And I'll explain that in a little bit. But we have ways of telling whether it's necessary, and if it is, we put it down. And the reason we put it down, because it takes me anywhere from ten minutes to an hour. Well, I've got to do it within three minutes. I mean, if you really need it. We can't wait that long. So I have to try to second-guess nature and say, what's nature up to? Am I going to be into trouble? If there's any suspicion at all, that's indication to do the procedure. The original pacemakers I dealt with were about this big square. We now have a very lightweight pacemaker. I'll turn it on and pass it around the room. It has several adjustments, adjust the milliampereage or current that the patient gets. This particular pacemaker is a, is a brilliant pacemaker. It's called a demand pacemaker. It can be either continuous or demand. Continuous means it's going to beat 60 beats a minute no matter what. Demand means that if it's beating at 60 beats a minute and suddenly you throw in an extra beat, it'll shut off for a certain period of time. The reason it does that is that if it happens to hit on your heart at a time just after its beat itself, it can precipitate a serious arrhythmia all by itself. So they have added a safety factor here which does the thinking for us, and to me it's been a, a magnificent improvement. I'm alluding to the fact then that all is not particularly well, that there are comp potential complications, and that uh, progress is still being made. Approximately uh, two years ago, at Christmas, I was called to a home, an elderly woman, in her 80s or 79 or thereabouts, was having convulsions. A house call, remember that. <laughs> Doesn't happen too often. And uh, I felt her pulse and I had trouble finding it. And every once in a while I would feel it beat. It became apparent to me that she was having convulsions because the brain was not getting enough oxygen. So. Uh, we rushed her to the hospital and I put a temporary catheter, but it was obvious that in her case this was a permanent problem. And in retrospect, she'd been having trouble off and on for various per periods of time. 
and it rendered uh, me an opportunity to do our first permanent implantable pacemaker. It's obvious that Dr. Names was not the only one thinking about the problem. This comes from Medtronic, and there are many other companies that make very good pacemakers. You notice that the nature of this catheter is a little bit more flexible, it's a little softer, it's a little less apt to perforate the ventricle wall. It has two electrodes on the end. You can see all the wiring here. And with the assistance of Dr. Leroy Johnson, a skin flap was made, a catheter was introduced, buried under the skin. This was put in a pocket in the skin flap. It was attached, proved to be functioning normally, and closed. And this then went this way under the skin, over the clavicle or bone here, down the jugular vein, and on in to the ventricle. I have here then an x-ray of that patient and uh, it will perhaps uh, allow you to have a little better idea uh, what I'm talking about. This shows the permanent type technique. You can see the x-ray of the pacemaker. It has five batteries. The life of the battery is estimated anywhere between 20 and 30 months, which is better than my flashlights and the little Christmas toys <laughs> that run by battery. And uh, it is left in place causing the heart to beat either continuously, if you have that kind of pacemaker, or when needed. I might say this, this woman, uh, uh, six months later, had an acute myocardial infarction. And at that time, she lost her heart block and got better. And for the following uh, eight or nine months, she was beating on her own. She turned off the uh, pacemaker. She just, the heart turned it off. And I saw her last week at a nursing home, 80-some years old, keep that in mind, absolutely dependent on society now, keep that in mind. And uh, her rate was uh, back to 60 beats a minute, which was the rate I set the pacemaker at, and I suspect now the pacemaker is functioning again. So we're keeping her alive, and it's an expensive procedure. We'll talk about that a little bit. Then a little later, I had a, an interesting problem. I had a patient that I couldn't get the catheter into the ventricle. Beads of sweat rolling down both eyebrows, and uh, I just simply couldn't get the catheter in the ventricle. I had recently then, at that time, read an article from Duke University where they were pacing patients by way of the, what's called the coronary sinus. The coronary sinus is a, a vein of the heart that empties into the atrium. Remember, you had atrium upstairs, ventricle downstairs. And so I left it in the coronary sinus, and when I paced the patient or turned on the pacemaker, I found that I was first getting an electrical depolarization from the atrium and then the ventricle, which in effect is really better because now I was able to take advantage of the muscle power of the whole heart. The upstairs would beat, and then the downstairs would beat, and that's the way it's supposed to be. And you can improve the heart work by about 20%. I was able to do it in this patient because he was not a heart block problem. He was the third indication for use of pacemaker. And this is a patient who doesn't have heart block. In other words, the electricity can go from the upstairs to the downstairs without any interference. But he had multiple irregularities from all over the heart. Anyway, as far as I know, I think he was the first patient in Iowa to have an atrial pacing setup. There's another way in which uh, we pace people. Uh, I have not done it here. It's done in Iowa City. Uh, Iowa City strongly favors the use of epicardial, uh, opening the chest up, putting electrodes on the outside of the heart, and then burying everything under the skin and so forth, as you've seen here. Uh, I uh, find indications for that in my own experience. Uh, not as they do. We have honest differences of opinion. Uh, first of all, someone this age, I don't think should have their chest opened up. <laughs> a major surgical procedure that carries a 7% mortality, whereas a catheter technique is less than 1%. Uh, but I do want to mention it because it is a legitimate way to put in pacemakers, and uh, there are many ways to skin a cat.
The only other technique I want to mention to you now is that we do have a transthoracic technique where we put a needle in the patient's chart and the chest, introduce this catheter and it bends in neatly as soon as it gets inside the chamber we pull back and it makes contact and we then can pace them through the chest until we can do a more permanent procedure. All right, now I've told you all the nice things we can do, or maybe not so nice. I alluded a little bit to our first patient who's 80, oh, let's make it good, I'm not sure, 89, who's in the nursing home. I tell you that I explained to the daughter that I didn't have to do this procedure and that it was a family decision, that I could maintain life in her, but should I? And that wasn't fair either. Because what was I asking her to do? I was asking her to kill her mother. You know, I'm the nice guy. I said, well, look, I can do all these nice things for you, but it's up to you. Rather than suffer the pangs of guilt, she said, goodness sakes, doctor, do anything you can to save her. So we did. The next thing I knew, I had two patients. I had a mother that was mad because she was alive and a daughter that was mad because she was alive and depressed and angry and hostile. The only thing good I did was that I did my first permanent pacemaker so that somebody who wants to stay alive and whose relatives want them to stay alive will be able to have this offered at the time it's needed most, which is right away. <laughs> That's the only thing good I can tell you about that experience. So what criteria do we use? Who do we dis right, let's, let's go a little bit further. About one month after that, you found that your insurance premiums have gone up. And now you're mad at the medical profession for what they did. Well, it's all right. Maybe you should be mad. I don't know. This is a so so social problem. We've got to decide as a group. I'm not God. I, my nurse and I were trying to estimate what the cost was and we conservatively estimated a cost of $3,000. Medicines, equipment, which is not cheap. That pacemaker you're, I'm passing around with a catheter coming out of it is about $700. Yeah, that's $700 right there and I haven't put a bill in yet. That's what the co company cost me to get it. Hold so does the patient have absolute right to demand what his or her insurance company will pay to keep him alive? Maybe he does. I mean, this is a, I don't know. <laughs> I wish somebody would answer these questions for me. 90 year, worse yet, a 90 year old lady brought to me by a doctor in another community. It was his mother and he says, do something for her. I said, she's 90 years old, should I? He says, do it. I said, all right, I will. And when I got done, she looked at me with such grateful eyes and she says, why didn't you let me die? And she died anyway about three months later. $3,000. It's a lot of money. Of course, we buy cars for that much. I think if we were 20 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old, or even 90 with all our marbles and all our faculties, it would be worth it. I'll tell you, I find it hard standing at the bedside watching that EKG and knowing I can do something, but should I? It tears me up. And whether you know it or not, it's tearing you up financially if I don't make the right decision. And I don't always make the right decision because I'm like you, you know. Nobody wants to make decisions anymore. <laughs> you know, let him do it, then I'll give him hell after he makes it. What do you think about it? We establish boards 
you know, it's set criteria? Do we leave it up to the medical profession? Let's go a little bit further. We have artificial hearts now. Mechanical hearts, and I'm telling you, they're not working right yet. But if you, how many saw the man in the white suit? Alec Guinness? Thank you, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I could count on him. Well, essentially, he discovered a suit that would never wear out. And would always be clean, right. And everybody, you know, it was a wonderful invention. And suddenly the textile industries realized, you know, you just make that suit once, buddy. <laughs> and business was falling, you know, and the stock market was crashing, and people were starting to, you know. Anyway, he got beat up a little. And in the movie, he's leaving, right? He's got no clothes on because the suit that he invented that would never wear out suddenly disintegrated, and he's standing there in his shorts. And this all happened just before they're ready to kill him, you know. Now everybody's laughing and so forth, you know, and he's walking away. But he's not too upset. His jaws are set, and he's walking down the street, and you have a feeling he'll be back. And he will find that suit that will never wear out. So don't delay thinking about the problem of the artificial heart or the heart transplant. Sure, we still got problems. Sure, we have antibodies that are killing kidneys and antibodies that are killing hearts. Don't worry, that man in the white suit's going to be back. He's walking down the street like this, and he's going to beat it, and he will. Now, how do we handle the problem? Remember, I started you out with someone we all love who's dying, and you want to do something in an overpopulated world. Uh, I have purposely slanted the discussion towards the problem. I have by no means covered the complications that we can get into with pacing. pacing and, if, and if you want to hear about it, you can ask me. I'll be glad to discuss it. Uh, we have people in the community alive. We have farmers farming whose hearts have stopped or whose hearts went into fibrillation, and they would have been dead then. And we have several nurses in the hospital who are personally responsible for having these people be alive. And I give them due credit because, after all, we might spend the time training them, but the work has to be done by them frequently, not in putting catheters down, but certainly in, in diagnosing significant warning signs so we can get there to do something about it, and certainly in emergency shock of the chest if required. And this patient is happy and is uh, living the kind of life he wants to leave and uh, making a very satisfactory adjustment. We have other patients much younger who have pacemakers who are no longer having spells. You know, doctor, I have these funny spells. <laughs> you know, like I don't breathe and I turn blue. <laughs> They're very interesting. So I, uh, it is a, a very rewarding, emotionally for me, uh, experience. And uh, it has been very exciting. And it's not every day, you know, that you're posed with these critical uh, decision. Certainly, I would be more than willing to spend three thousand, six thousand, ten thousand dollars for ten more years of life. To me, it would be worth it, personally, for me. It might at this point in time. Uh, at age eighty, I think I'd go out and have a good time. <laughs> <laughs>